All right, and I do a little intro and then... Welcome to the Massage Hodge Podcast. My name is Nick Paterka, a licensed massage therapist in the Portland, Oregon area. And I am joined by Julie Gustafson, the executive director of the Pearl District Business Association. Say hi, Julie. Hi. Awesome. And specifically, um, I'm having you on because I am a member of this wonderful organization that supports this local business community. We call it the PDBA for short, in case you hear us reference that. And um, Julie's been so welcoming and kind and has got me set up and meeting all these people. And I think uh, we're going to talk about event planning. Uh, So this episode, not particularly about massage therapy, but there's going to be some interesting uh, things in here to to learn from, and I'm excited about it. So Julie, we're going to start with a little bit about your history and how you came to be the executive director, which sounds <laughs> I love the very, way you say that. <laughs> very impressive. I like that too. Oh, it's a great title, um, but really it's the do-all, be-all for the PDBA. Yeah. Um, no, uh, my history is actually completely different. So talking about going with event planning versus massage therapy, um, my background's actually in French education. I used to be a high school French teacher. Wow. Um, grew up here in Portland, started French in high school, just fell in love with it. I mean, you must say something to me in French now. I won't understand. Pourquoi je peux parler de beaucoup de choses en français? Oh, c'est, man. C'est très, tellement facile pour moi. My automatic um, transcription is not going to be able to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> I basically just said I can talk about a lot of things in French. I bet so. you can. That's awesome. <laughs> um, but so I, I grew up wanting to be a teacher, went down, lived in Southern California for eight years, um, and taught high school French. Loved wow. it, just couldn't stand the town I was in anymore. Okay. Just wasn't the right fit for me. I thought you were about to say, couldn't stand teenagers anymore. <laughs> no, actually, I do miss teaching high school. Oh, that's cool. Um, so that's where I get a lot of that ability to just walk through things a thousand times or talk to people, answer the yeah. questions. That all comes from that education background. So it, it does still play in today. Mm-hmm. Um, and funny enough, I was the senior class advisor. So I helped plan graduation, grad night, um, the pool party, the you know all the different. So grad you've been brunch. you've been planning from the get. So yeah. I got me into event planning when I was teaching. Wow. Uh, then I came back to Portland, kind of went, okay, what's next? Had that kind of third life crisis at uh, thirty. <laughs> realized I needed to go find the happy in life, sure. and uh, came back here and. My dad was executive director of Portland Streetcar and said, hey, we need someone to do some stupid odd jobs for us that we can trust. Okay. So I sat out on a corner and counted how many times a streetcar got stopped at the max crossing. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Little things like that that led me to ending up being the assistant manager of communications for Portland Streetcar, eventually the communications manager uh, for Portland Streetcar. And while I was there, I ended up being on the board of our beloved Pearl District Business Association. Oh, and and just pause. If, yes. If one is listening to this from outside the city of Portland, the streetcar is part of our wonderful public transit system. Yes. There's the MAX line, mm-hmm. there's the streetcar, there's buses. And, and yeah. Portland Streetcar is the oldest new, quote unquote, modern system in the country. Um, I actually still work with streetcar companies to do an annual conference every year, which is one of the things we'll talk about later. Sure. Um, but I was with Streetcar for 10 years. I've ended up on the board of the Pearl District Business Association, the PDBA, was the vice president in line to be the next president of the board. Um, everything was going great. And then our executive director left mm. and we were doing a search. Meanwhile, at Streetcar, I had started out doing the events. I planned the big, um, $100,000 grand opening event to the east side. I did all the construction communications. So I had been the business liaison for years. Right. Had already been doing a lot of work with businesses. Well, when construction stops and there's no fun events to plan, I ended up doing data and customer service. So I did a lot of email responses and phone call answering and, um, you know, Twitter and social media. Sure. Especially during snowstorms. <laughs> um, and... That all led to, okay, I'm trying to find something that's challenging me and inspiring me again. And for me, it's really the events and those business interactions that were the big inspiration when I was at Streetcar. So lo and behold, random conversations happened, and I ended up being the new executive director of the PDVA. 
Very cool. It just was kind of this natural progression yeah, that happened. Yeah, makes total sense. Um, and it's been a just a joy for yeah. me. Uh, it's amazing how much I found myself coming alive and how much my friends said, wow, you're so much happier. You, you seem to really be flourishing in this mm-hmm. position. Um, and the PDBA, I think, is flourishing as well. Yeah. We have a lot more people involved, active, participating. Um, um, tell me. And that's been a big big influence for me. Remind me how many members strong we are these days. Uh, ebbs and flows sure, as renewals course. happen. Yes. But it's around 215 businesses. 215. That now, I don't mean to put all those other Pearl businesses on blast, but how many approximate businesses are there in the Pearl District area? Well, <laughs> Depends on what you would count as an official business. Okay. The official number is 1,200 something. However, I would say almost half of those are the random LLC of someone oh, who's okay. retiring but lives in the Pearl. So their business address is their home address. Okay. So what we could maybe. Or, use... like, for example, my event planning business that currently, my little side gig, yes. that does the one conference. So I'm not really looking to connect a network for it. Right. Yeah. Is registered at my home address. So it counts against the percentage for Northeast Broadway Business Association. Uh, My dad has seven uh, LLCs. LLCs. He doesn't need to network with the businesses on the street or really get business in Understood. So I would say we probably have about 600 businesses that could benefit from the PDPA and over 200. So over a third are members. Okay. And that's pretty darn good. Yeah. Well, but okay. Now this might be a trickier situation for you to say. But I can say it. If you have a business in the Pearl District, you we're stronger together. Come join us. It's fun. I can <laughs> I've say met, that I've met, too. I've I met. Just... So, I you know I don't you know I don't. Of course, yeah. I just. Um, but I agree. I've enjoyed the coffees and the, and the morning meetings and mm-hmm. uh, the events and I yeah. There's just a lot of great great people to connect with. I took over the. Instagram account that was a lot of fun. Oh my I gosh, met I've so gotten many so many compliments about that one. Oh yeah, people really enjoyed it. Um, and I actually have a couple of businesses that are looking to do something similar down yeah. the line. Tell them to wear good walking shoes. Oh yeah, <laughs> um, I think I covered eight miles that day. Yeah, it, yeah. it was very impressive. That and one I've was gotten epic. compliments from yeah. a lot of people about that day's Instagram. Yeah, I was like, I cannot replicate that every day. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you get so many steps in. I have too many emails yeah, to respond I to understand. every day. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like I'd need a massage daily if I did that every day. <laughs> no doubt. So well, it's okay. That's, that's how you came to be the that's executive the short director. Version, yes. Yeah. <laughs> the short version's okay. I think yes. that kind of covers the ground. Um a big part of what you do um through the PDBA and on the side is event planning and mm-hmm. you've as you said, you've been doing it since those high school French days. What do you love about planning events? I love, really, I love the end result. Yeah. I love seeing people come to life and enjoy Mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, But I also love the minutia. I love the little details and those little touches that I can put on. Um, I've done scrapbooking and crafting and, you know, dabbled in graphic design and taken some online classes. And so I can do little things that are those little touches beyond what someone else has done in the past. Yeah. Um, an example of that with the annual conference I plan is I made these new table tents that incorporated the new branding that were obviously hand done with, you know, you print out the, the table tent with the name and the branding, but then you do the one border of one color and another border mm. of another color, all in the nice card stock. It's all in the branding colors, but it also makes it stronger Rather than just printing it on the white one you can get from Avery products, which are great. Right. And folding it and putting it out there. But yeah, when when someone attends that event, they might not they might not point to that and be like, wow, this is that's fancy. They but it just like it takes it, it to another level. F- they feel it in a way they can't mm-hmm. uh, describe necessarily. And so I always love adding a new touch every time I do an event or a new little detail. Yeah. A new little twist, a new little something that makes that event continue to feel fresh, new, and exciting. Um, seeing people walk into the business awards and the colors. And this year, the minor changes were the table numbers. I had my, we have interns this year at the PDBA mm. from MLC up the street. Um, so one of them is really interested in graphic design. So I let her run. 
And so the name tags and the table tents were a little different this year, or the table numbers were different this year. And people really liked that. But then we also brought that same color, which was our secondary marketing color, Mm -hmm. which is one we hardly ever use, brought that in into the napkins on the tables as well. Oh, cool. So instead of having just the beautiful lime green tablecloths, which last year when I did that, everyone was like, really? You're going with lime green? And then they walked in, they're like, oh my God, this is beautiful. It looks right. like a PDBA event. Uh, um, and, but I did cream uh, napkins this year. All the details. Adding an extra detail. Yeah. And also because I knew people weren't going to be so shocked by all the color. Last year, the you know, you throw in one color at them instead of just black and white and very simple. You know, you throw a color at them. Then the next year, you add a little bit more. You add a little bit more and you just keep, you know progressing the event yeah. progressing what's going on yeah i and imagine it's really forward. hard to consider i want to say logistics that's not what i'm trying to get at i'm sure there's so many logistics to consider i'm trying to say like the the big picture and the little picture like you have to consider the event as a whole mm-hmm. but and then and the, but then also so you're spending time in the minutia and those details that make mm-hmm. the whole better mm-hmm. yeah exactly and it's it's going from, okay, here's our big big picture budget. This is how much we've raised through the sponsors. This is what we can spend. We have to get the food. We have to get tables and chairs and linens. Yes. Okay. Here are the big items. We have to get the plaques. Because without the plaques, what are you giving to the winners? Right. Oh, this is the awards. This is the awards yeah. ceremony. But even if you're talking about the name tags, the, you know, all the, we do uh, for the, annual conference I plan, I'd put together a whole book of projects. It takes me several months to put together because I have to chase down every city for them to give me their update mm. because I'm not, I don't know their updated information. They right. do. Of course. I don't have their branding fonts and their branding colors and their every piece of detail. They do. Yeah. But I was able to take it one year from a printer in DC that didn't know me. I didn't know them. I couldn't review it before it was printed, had done some bad jobs for us in the past, brought it back to a Portland printer. It used to be high, um, headquartered here in the Pearl. Oh, yeah. But they expanded and had to be moved out. Um, it was Premier Press, and they still do the printing for that event. Um, and they took that book from being kind of eh, printed to beautiful, full-color, glossy, trimmed Ooh. down pages. It just takes it to looking like a much more professional production. Yeah, for sure. Production. Yeah. Um, all those little things, uh, able to talk that other organization into rebranding. They had a logo that was done for free by a member who could do some CAD drawings and, you know, it looked fine and dandy, but we didn't have a high res. We didn't have a transparent background of it. We didn't have, you know, all those things. It was done in 2004. Okay. And it was done to that standard. Yeah. Well, what we do now in even 2016, 17, 18, 19, now 2020 completely different graphic standards yeah and so being able to get the organization to come on board rebrand and then take it to the nth level with everything i did with the name tags and we got um you know those nice conference name pouches Mm -hmm. so we bought a bunch of those that could be for years that have the logo right on it the lanyard type thing right oh yeah oh yeah that 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 really makes it feel like a real event so now it's like a real conference yeah those are things i wanted to do from the beginning Uh but i didn't want to do with the old logo yeah i didn't want to have those sitting around forever that's smart so it was nice that once we had that new logo then bring it in and everyone goes wow that looks really great yeah or all of a sudden there's not a white box on the cover to have the logo it's integrated into the imagery much oh cool and well, it sounds so like it's been fun. you have a lot of thoughts about events. Always. <laughs> I'm always making them better, too, I think. To that end, I would not consider myself a uh, successful event planner. I can't even, can't even think of a, like a big event I've, even a birthday party that I've really been <laughs> in charge of planning. Um, and so I'm going to solicit your advice. Okay. Because we're sitting now and recording inside of Massage Hodgepodge here in Portland's Pearl District, um, which also happens to be where I live. But I would like to um, host a open house to show people this. Um, and, and we're actually recording on the massage therapy table itself, doubles as my podcast studio, as it were. 
Works and, great. <laughs> yeah, it seems to work so far. And I just would like to figure out a, a nice way to invite the community in to come see it and talk mm -hmm. to them and show them this mini oasis that I've created right in the heart of the uh, heart of the pearl. Mm -hmm. So things that are like sort of on my mind about that. It's not huge in here. I don't want like a hundred people to show up all at once. Not that they ever would, but I don't know. Where, where do I begin? How do I begin thinking about this? And maybe the first question to ask is how much time do I need to plan? I would plan probably about an hour and a half to two hours. Yeah. Um, for I, the event itself. For the event See, itself. Right off the bat. I was thinking it should be a longer stretch so that people could come and go and like. No, you keep it short because they're more likely to pop in. Okay. Um, if if you're giving them a 10-hour day or an 8-hour day, they're going to look at that and go, oh, I can come in at any time, and then they forget about it. Versus if it's on their calendar, they get alerted it's starting at 5 o'clock or 4.30 or whatever right. time you want to start. Um, they go, oh, I can swing by real quick, or I'll swing by on my way home after work, or I'll do this, this, yeah. this, come in for a little while. They may stay longer. Yes. But then it can always go longer than that if people are having a good time. Yeah. But if you kind of say, hey, it's from five to seven, it seems to have worked for us for our networking events. Yeah. Um, you get people who are more likely to pop in. What I've noticed is when someone gives them all day, uh -huh. you might be less likely. You might end up with people showing the same amount of people. You don't feel as successful because you've given your whole day to it. Yes. Um, other people don't feel as, as successful because there was less people there when they were there. Right. You might have the same 35 people go through. Okay. But you get them further spread out. And so it, it, yeah, it, it limits lowers that. that feeling of success. Yes. And sometimes what you want out of an event is a feeling of success. Yeah. Like very honestly, PDBA luncheon. One year it could be 120. One year it's 160. 120 felt just as successful as 160 yeah. for attendance. It's more about the enjoyment people are having, how you set the room, knowing on what you have, and then mm -hmm. going from there. Okay, cool. Um, day of the week opinions. Um, avoid weekends. Of course. Yeah, I kind of figured. Yeah. yeah. Um, including Friday. Including Friday. Yeah. Very honestly, a lot of people work a four-day week or they work an off week. Um, I would avoid Mondays as well because not a lot of businesses are open on Mondays. So if you want your neighbors who are in business to come in, yeah, Monday is, an, is a closed day for a lot of things. Okay. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Thursdays are typically the day people are more willing to go out and have a good time mm -hmm. because they only have one day left of work if they have one at all. Got it. Thursday it is. Coming soon on a Thursday. How far out do I need to plan it? to be able to comfortably like get the word out and raise awareness and I would say two weeks to a month. It's you're not talking about a 150 person luncheon that you're selling tickets for. You're talking about a free event for people to come to. Yeah. So you don't want to put the word out so far in advance that they forget about it. Okay. Or that you have to remind them 18 times. Mm -hmm. You don't want to put it out the week of because it's not enough notice. Right. So oftentimes it's nice to get maybe a save the date out through social media about yeah. three weeks out. Maybe you have it done and you can start inviting people personally. Like, hey, a month from today I'm doing this event. Hope you can make it. Or three weeks from today I'm doing this event. Then get a save the date out through social media and then do an actual email blast that's inviting people to the event. Is it important to actually have anything printed? Do I need anything physical or is that a waste? I believe you would. Okay. I really don't. I think, um, for example, if you wanted to make it open, just to plug one of the things we offer at the PDBA, put it up on the event page. Oh, for sure. And that's the way you get it out to the neighborhood. Yeah. Um, share that event page out. Get it up there before the breakfast meeting of whichever month because then it'll be at the breakfast meeting as well. Oh, yes. Um, so, like, for example, if you were going to do this the end of February or mid-February, get it up on the calendar before next Monday. Mm -hmm. And then I would have it at the breakfast meeting on Wednesday and it would go from there. Okay. Not next week, the week after, you know what I mean? Awesome. So this those is, are, this is so helpful for me. So, yeah. okay. And thinking about the event itself, mm -hmm. what 
should I offer? Should I... Beer and wine is always a good thing. Beer and wine. Mm -hmm. And then like some kind of snacks, some kind Mm -hmm. of spread or something like that. Yeah. And and you can do... And also make sure you have non-alcoholic options. Yep. Um, First off, there's some people who have extended dry Uary into dry January and February. (laughs) Dry decade, maybe. (laughs) <laughs> some people who have gone with dry lifetime well of course yeah. um but you, you have everything in between uh it's always good because you never know what situation people are in always have whether it be sparkling water or just even some tap water with lemon in it um, oh, yeah something simple that people can have that is seems more classed up mm-hmm. you don't have to necessarily go spend a lot of money on all of the options yes you know go buy the bulk veggies and cut them yourself if you want to yeah you know it's you don't have to go buy the crudite platter that's already laid out for you yeah though i'm I'm sure there's maybe a member or two that could i'm sure there's a member or two you could talk to talk to um, that would enjoy participating and being a part it's all about those connections you make and um i know for our networking events it's always okay here's the host and now we start reaching out to beer wine etc to see what we can make happen start reaching out to some food options yeah, go from there. That's great. Mm-hmm. And do I need to worry about any like? I mean, it's just coming in and talking to people, and I don't need activities or anything. No. Like, yeah, no. It's really about yeah. people coming, making sure the space looks beautiful. Yeah, um, that it's set up the way you want it to be. To you know, so people can see that this is a massage table. Yes, not a podcast studio. Um, <laughs> though they might be interested in that too. You never yeah, know. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, but having it set up nicely, having a few places to sit, maybe bringing in some folding chairs, just have a couple extra seating options, depending on how busy or not it is. Folding chairs are nice for something like that because you can put them away if it's really crowded. Uh, oh, yeah, for sure. So that makes sense. it's one of those things that you never know if someone is in retail and has been standing all day, having a place to sit makes them stick around and talk to you a little bit longer. Yeah. Whereas someone who's been sitting all day wants to stand and kind of relax that way. Okay. So having the option is always a good thing at those types of events. Wow. I think I'm I think I'm ready to start planning this now. I think you are. Yeah. <laughs> I can't think of anything. There's nothing else top of mind. I mean, yeah, it was the the length was that's probably the most instructive thing for me that one and a half to two hours instead of like making it a, a whole thing. Yeah. A whole absolutely. Day. Yeah. When you make it a whole day, it really does it dilutes it. It does yeah, dilute it, yeah. but it also makes it less attractive for someone to come to. Okay. Because they kind of go, oh, they're giving me all day to come? Eh. I'll right. go another time. Yeah. Yeah. I'll go later and then they forget. Should yeah. I consider like um, a, an extra draw, like some kind of giveaway? Like, I mean, sure. pretty obvious what I could give away, uh, I would think. Yeah. Um, Stop on by my open house and enter to win a free massage. Yeah. Easy. That's an easy one to do. You get people who are, you know, inter- interested. Yeah. Um, or even don't advertise it, but give away to people who are here because sometimes they message out to their friends. So giving your like introductory massage certificates or something else yeah. to anyone who attends and then they message out to friends, friends stop by. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes there's there's both ways to play that. Okay. Smart. But yeah. Yeah. It all depends on what, what you'd rather do. If you'd rather yeah. just give out one do that and advertise it. Sure. Okay. So that's, I think that covers like your assistance with planning my micro little, uh, fabulous. Glad I could help. Big open house. I should, I should think bigger. I shouldn't call it so little. It's, it's going to be, it it's, it's going to be huge. For you, it's huge. <laughs> yeah, it, it should be. Um, and we've touched on this next question a little bit, but I'd love you to riff a little bit more. What, okay. what goes into planning a big event? So for a big event, I'll really focus on the biggest one I plan, which is a three-day conference for approximately 120 people from all over the country who are interested in streetcars. Okay. So These are cities that have streetcars or that want streetcars? Cities, planners, engineers, manufacturers... The cities either have them or want them. So it's it's across the board. The location changes. Yes, every okay. single year. The first six years we were in D.C. every year. Okay. Um, nothing was really happening with the federal legislation. So we started moving it around to different mm. cities and the membership votes. Oh. Um, so we have the cities 
submit to being hosts. They have to agree to helping me get the hotel, Mm -hmm. helping with staffing the conference. Mm -hmm. So registration tables, things like that, printing up some stuff for me so that I don't have to ship it from Oregon to wherever we're going. Right. Uh, This April will be in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. No kidding. Yes. Last year we were in Tucson, Arizona in February. It actually snowed. Uh, (laughs) Um, Fun fact. um, My mom is from milwaukee wisconsin really yeah oh how and she fun. still and she lives in the milwaukee area to this oh, day nice. and that's where she met my dad oh and i have two siblings that also live in the greater milwaukee area small world i love that town it's a small world yeah it's really fun yeah i've never been i'm really excited to go um so i've been in communication with the hotel so my job starts a year before the conference oh. with negotiating reaching out to multiple hotels for proposals mm-hmm of what the cost would be to be in their space and what dates they have available for us in our desired time frame. I then negotiate, 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 narrow it down and select a hotel, sign a contract with them, mm-hmm. then start working on the food and beverage orders, the audiovisual plans, the um, seating chart, which actually bringing us all the way back to the beginning. Mm-hmm. One year, the first year we changed from one building to another for our conference, they'd set it up in little four pods of tables so people were all facing each other to inspire conversation yeah well it's not a great way to inspire conversation amongst the room it's a great way to get people to talk during a panel Ah. i learned that (laughs) when i was teaching (laughs) so i put the seating in a double u shape where there's a u on the inside and then a u around the outside okay i can picture that which promotes conversation amongst the group which is what we wanted did that in my classrooms because Ah. i wanted my french students to talk to each other not just amongst each other and not pay attention to me, but have conversations in French in class. Yeah. So using the same setup that I used in my classrooms. Yes. For this conference. Though now presumably the streetcar attendees are not required to speak in French. No, they, they speak in <laughs> engineering logistical terms oh, which and might which be is more its own foreign language. Yeah. Yeah. But uh no, they we speak in streetcar talk. Yeah. But for sure. uh yeah, not definitely not in French, though there are some there who do speak French. Learned that last year. That was fun. Um, but so just I work with the hotel and the setup. I work with the hotel on making sure we have enough microphones. We have the kinds of microphones you can turn on and off for the tables where the speakers are or where the participants are. Then we have the panel. We have the AV set up. I have to work with the city to make sure I have a laptop accessible because I need my laptop to handle payments and things oh, during yeah. the conference. Yeah. So rather than me you having to buy have... a second laptop, I have to make sure that I get all the name tags printed and ready to go before I go. Then work out having a place to print them when I'm there. I have to work out getting making sure we have transit fare for everybody. Um, and then oh, I also negotiate with the hotel on our room rate. Okay. We have a block of rooms get the information out to our registrants. Then about six months out, I have to start working on the agenda. So I'm in the process of that right now for our conference that's at the end of April. A little behind on that, but I will catch up this weekend. I believe it. Um, you must have the most epic checklists. Oh, yeah. I, I can't. Like, Some this of is them are written and most like, of them are in my mind because this is yeah. the 12th of these I've done. Right. Yeah, I remember when and, I started. And so it's just kind of moves through it quickly now. When I started making podcasts, I had this like list, the order of events in which how I would produce and like, mm-hmm. you know, from finding the guest to deploying the the finished edited materials. And now I just roll through it. I barely look at the list. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it's, it's part of it is repetition, doing the same event over and over and over again. Um, my first breakfast meeting for the PDBA, I had a checklist Yeah, and I checked it all off. Now I'm like, all right, I got this and I do it. And sometimes I'm running around the day before going, oh my gosh, I forgot X, Y, or Z. You know, usually that last piece, but most of it's done. Yeah. You know, it all depends on what's going on. What else is going on in the world? So many details swirling around in your head all the time. Final negotiations on the food and beverage contract. Yeah. Putting together the registration on the website. Downtown Milwaukee? Yes, at the Fister Hotel. Okay. I'm going to look that up and see where it's situated. It's a nice historic hotel right on the streetcar line. Um, Cool. But so I'm in in the process of doing all of those pieces. Then once the agenda is set, now I'm working on reaching out and getting speakers. And we always are trying Ah. to find new speakers. 
same companies a lot of the time, but trying to find different speakers because for a while there was a rut going on where the same mm. dozen people or so were up there talking. Um, and, and, I, and one might be surprised by the, you can find some dynamic speakers in the streetcar world. Oh, believe it or not. I one believe of our it. best conferences ever last year, we had someone who'd never spoken. We'd always gone to this other company. Um, this other company was just a lot more involved. And so they just got asked first. Mm. And I said, well, rather than going with the same company we always go with, which is a company I love, I've worked with very closely. Um, there was another person who has also been this same level of sponsorship in the same industry, just hasn't been as vol involved because he's kind of a one man show as far as this level and really getting involved. And he's trying to get his company to be more involved. He, we asked him to speak on the topic of raising construction costs. Okay. Which is a big problem in the streetcar industry. And so he actually laid out this amazing PowerPoint with all these facts and data about how the tariffs have been impacting the price of all the components. Oh, wow. And that it's actually not that streetcar projects are getting more expensive per se. It's that all the little pieces are getting more expensive. Ah. And so it was showing that all of the construction costs can rising and the overages in the bids that have happened in the last year or at that point, the last year could all be related back to the tariffs and what it caused to happen to the price of the components. Wow. Even the ones that were American made. And if you are in the streetcar world, that's probably it was mind -blowing. riveting. Yeah. Well, it, <laughs> but also the way he presented it. I bet. Yeah. He didn't just present it like here are facts. Here, yeah. Yeah. Here, he was like, okay, so here's what's going on. And he was up, he was animated, he was interesting. That's great. And self-deprecating to some degree, uh, which I've always found really? is a good one when you're yeah, talking in front fun. of people. You'll notice I do that at breakfast meetings quite a bit. <laughs> okay. It gets people laughing, gets people loose and comfortable. Also gets them more comfortable asking me questions that they might think are stupid. Oh, sure. Um, Because there is no such thing. Honestly, I don't care if you ask me the same question 20 times. If you're not comfortable with the answer, I didn't answer it right. Yeah. So the more I can make a fool out of myself once in a while, it allows people to feel more comfortable doing something they might think could possibly potentially be considered foolish to me. Yeah. Well, it certainly seems like you have these big events figured out after all these years. Pretty cool. So far, so good. So let me ask you this, and uh, we didn't prep on this one, but this is an idea that I've been kicking around, mm -hmm. and this is long-term goal. But okay. I, just, I just want your thought about where would one begin so that I can kind of ruminate on this. So I don't know if you're familiar with an event um, in Oregon called the Mission of Mercy. Does that ring a bell? A little bit. Yeah. So Mission of Mercy is run by the Oregon Dental Association. Okay. And they organize volunteers and they create this like huge dental clinic. In, in Portland, it's usually at the convention center. It's massive. Okay. And people who don't have access to dental care wait in this huge line and they come in and they get the care they need and it's all you know for them it's all mm -hmm. free mm -hmm. and i've been speaking to some friends in the previous episode of this podcast particularly about access to massage therapy mm -hmm. and different ways to figure out how to give back to the community mm -hmm. and i like this idea of the mission of mercy and body work and maybe finding some day to like mm -hmm. activate the therapist as volunteers and find organizations to sponsor such a thing mm -hmm. and get a space big enough. And then to say to the community, like, do you need body work? Have you ever wondered what it was like, but you can't imagine affording it? Like, it's free for you. Come in this day. You'll be paired up with a therapist. You'll get to see what it's like. And mm -hmm. I just think that would be such a positive impact in, mm -hmm. in, in my world as a massage therapist and like to really start the conversation about access to care. So just imagining an event like that, where would one begin? I would begin by finding a couple of other people that want to work on it with you. Yeah. So the first thing you need is a small group that really has the vision has the strength of mission mm -hmm. to make it happen. Yeah. Um, the second thing you need is sponsors. You need sure. dollars. Yes. And sometimes it might be that there's some bigger companies that provide massage therapy 
that maybe don't have the personnel, but would be willing to put some dollars behind it. Yeah. Um, especially if their name gets put out there with this. Oh, of course. Yeah. That's um, kind of that game that you have oh, to play. Yeah. yeah. But I would start with that. The other thing is a venue. And it's reaching out and finding out if there's a venue you can find that works with very little add-on. Yeah. Or is there a venue you can find that um, would even be willing to be a sponsor in trade for the venue? Yes. So it's figuring out. So you start with your small group. Yeah. And you figure out what find kind of core. venue you need. Yeah. Like, what are you really trying to do with this event? Are you looking at maybe it's people come in and it's a little bit more like, for example, what I would get done at my chiropractor if they're doing a little massage where my clothes are still on, you know, and they're doing, you know, maybe on the shoulders it's underneath, but other places it's not. So you don't need as many of the walls and right. the protections and curtains. Or do you really want to go with a full on hour or half hour massage? Hmm. Then you need to look at, do you need piping and draping or do you need to find a space with a lot of rooms? Right. So it's really figuring out I wonder if the right what level you want to go to with the event and then figuring out what kind of venue you'd need to make that happen. Yeah. Then it's seeing if you can find that venue. Then it's seeing, okay, if we do this, this is what our budget has to be to make it happen. Yeah. So now can we find the dollars? Yeah. That's really so I mean you're you're looking at a long process oh, yeah. for the first one. After the first one, it's usually pretty quick to do a second one. Okay. It's easy, relatively. Yes. Because you've done the first one. It might be, you have an idea of the budget. It might be five years to launch idea. the big first one, but then it could become an annual. But it could become annual yeah. after that. And so, so yeah. Finding that core people. And and then maybe uh -huh. maybe the first time is 10 therapists. And maybe- And it's a community event. You know, like, Maybe it's a community event, or maybe you even look at- okay, maybe we want to have maybe five massage therapists, but maybe you bring in an acupuncturist and a chiropractor. And those two don't need as much privacy. Yeah, per se. or a, a Thai massage therapist, or, for example. Yeah. They're fully clothed. There's a mat on the ground. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe you bring in some different types of therapists. Yeah. And then you figure out, okay, we have three that need the piping, draping, or separate rooms. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go from there. This is the size of venue we're going to need to ha to house this many therapists. Yeah. If we can find one with three separate rooms, that would be great. If not, we need to incorporate in there's, the rental of piping and draping and make sure it's tall enough and big enough. There's some other precedents for for events that have had or do you get a lot of massage room? happening mm -hmm. in a big room at once, and I'm wondering how they've handled because I've seen pictures of it. It's they, another thing to do research. Yeah, I think they must. I think they might. Just have volunteers hold draping up while the person gets on the table, because I've I've seen pictures of those events and there's no piping up, but it's a huge room with like hundreds of people so on the table. So do research and, yeah. and and figure out where that took place. Yeah, because sometimes it depends on that the modesty the of yeah. the community. That was not here. Something that could happen in Europe. <laughs> it would be a lot harder to happen. It's where I was going. Yeah. Something in Europe where they go around topless on the beach mm -hmm. and the magazines all have toplessness. There's a lot less modesty. Not in a bad way. It, oh, no. It's just here based on what happened when the pilgrims first came over and it was the Puritans escaping. Yeah, just cultural. And so culturally, we've always been a more puritanical, prudish Again, not in a bad way, but we've definitely been a more conservative culture as far as clothing. Yeah. And as far as skin showing. Yes. Um, you know, there's judgment if someone wears a low cut top or Yeah, still. Um and, and so things like that occur where you might have been able to have just an open room where there's even just little changing cabins or something mm -hmm. or people holding up cloth around somebody yeah which may not fly here yeah in the states you're gonna need the separate space yeah um so it's something to to really look into yeah research other events if they have occurred how did they occur yeah see if you can find them and this is where that small group can really come in yeah play. i think you're right about finding this core group of people and just mm -hmm. starting to kick around ideas and have conversations and imagining Absolutely. what it could be like i just i think it could something like that could do a lot to elevate um, the profession as a whole and just speak to people about what 
body work can do for you and why it's Absolutely. valuable and just to, sh to show, to show the, the body work community about getting more access to care and mm -hmm. trying to figure that out because there's definitely well, a gap there. And I think it's also important to show people the breadth of importance of body work. Mm -hmm. um, I just had a conversation with a friend last night. She's had this injury. She's been doing physical therapy, but physical therapy alone. Okay. Physical therapy is great. But if it's a muscle related injury, you need to throw in the massage too. Or if it's a structural injury, mm -hmm. Having massage, having chiropractic, yeah. bringing them together shortens the amount of physical therapy you need, shortens the amount of recovery time, yeah. and can really bring things together. So it's it's putting that education forward yeah. through a community event in a way that's not preachy, that's not teachy, but is enlightening. Yeah, And that's one of the great things that a, an event can do yeah. in so many ways is it makes it approachable mm -hmm. and open for people. That's great. Very cool. Yay. I'm glad I asked about that. Yeah. So Julie Gustafson, the executive director of the Pearl District Business Association, how would one get in touch with you? What is your best avenue for such things? Oh my gosh. I'm so easy to get in touch with. I believe it. If you go to explorethepearl.com and just hit contact us, it comes directly to yeah. me. Yeah. You're us. <laughs> I am the us. <laughs> um or you can just email me directly. Uh, it's Julie, J-U-L-I-E, at explorethepearl.com. Oh, cool. And Instagram for the Pearl District Business it's Association? At Pearl Portland. Pearl Portland. And we're at, oh, gosh, well over 3,000 now yeah. and growing. And it's all organically grown. No yeah. purchased followers, which is great. Cool, very cool. And it's been growing rapidly since we started these Instagram takeovers with our members. It's been so much fun. Would... Do you have the bandwidth in your life to consider planning another big event for someone else? Is that is that on your radar? In the future, yes. Okay. I would say over the next several months, I'm going to be a little bit busy with yeah. both the bunny hop for the PDBA, which is our wonderful, fun Looking forward to Easter it. event. Yep. Um, so that's another big event I'm planning. And then two weeks later, I have the Streetcar Summit. Oh, wow. So my spring is yeah. pretty spoken for right mm -hmm. now. Um, but following that, I think uh, things are going to lighten up a little bit. That's cool. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Well, thank you for having me. I really me. appreciate this little education I received today. To everyone else out there, thanks so much for listening. Please feel free to subscribe to the podcast, and you can find a video of this and a transcription. We'll link to everything, and we'll see you next time. Cool. Cool.